Everyone likes to make a profit. Would that be right? Everyone likes to make a profit, don't they? But the question I think we're facing in uh, Titus 3 today is, are you a profitable person? Are you focusing on things that are going to help you grow and prosper? Or are you making a loss? Are you unprofitable? Everyone likes to make a profit, whether you're in business, uh, whether you're renovating a house, uh, whether you're um, growing crops or grazing cattle. You don't do that just for fun, do you? Uh, you do it to make a living, to make a profit. Even if you're running a cake stall down the main street, you want to make a profit. You don't want to make a loss. Everyone likes to make a profit. The question is, how do you make a profit? I studied economics at university for three years and they taught me that you've got to have more coming in than going out. Uh, you've got to be investing in something that's going to grow in value. Now, that's pretty easy, really, isn't it? You've got to be investing in something that's going to grow in value. You've got to have more coming in than it's going out. People can be profitable too. Uh, one of the big questions that's um, plagued my mind uh, all year, it's been, it's been heavy, weighing heavy on my mind all year, is, um, is Cooper Cronk worth the investment? Uh, the Roosters bought Cooper Cronk for a million bucks at the beginning of the year. And uh, I was a bit sceptical about it. Is he really worth a million bucks to the Roosters? Will he add value to the club? And if he's going to add value, how much is he going to add? Will we get enough return from investing in him? See, people can be profitable to your organisation or to your club. Uh, people can also be unprofitable. Remember when uh, the kids were little and they wanted to uh, help me wash the car and uh, they'd come out and they'd you'd give them a sponge and they'd, they'd rub it on the side of the car and then they'd drop it in the dirt and then they'd pick it up and rub it on the side of the car again, uh, rubbing scratches into the paintwork and, <laughs> okay, just uh, take a moment. Uh, kids can, oh, sorry, people can be unprofitable. It uh, reminds me of the story about the um, scout uh, who was doing Bob a job week, you know, when they used to go around and do jobs for you. And uh, they went to a house and the man said, yeah, well, I've got a job for you. He said, it's been something that's been needing doing for quite a while. Uh, you can paint the porch for me. So he gives them a tin of paint and a paintbrush and the kid goes out and he's back in about half an hour. <laughs> wow, that was, that was quick. He said, uh, he said, how'd you go? He said, yeah, it was good. And um, he said, right, yeah, well, he gave him his 20 bucks and and uh, the kid walked away and then he stopped and he turned around and he said, uh, by the way, mister, it's not a porch, it's a Ferrari. Sometimes people can be unprofitable. Now in this, um, in this passage, uh, when it comes to being one of God's people, is your trust in God returning a profit? Is your trust in God, is your life increasing in value? Are you adding to value to God's kingdom or are you being unprofitable and contributing to a loss in value? Uh, if you have a look in Titus there, and um, someone's stolen my Bible. I don't know who it is. Um, at the end of, uh, end of ch uh, verses 8 and 9 there in uh, Titus chapter 3, and we've been working our way through Titus. Hopefully uh, you're getting very familiar with the book by now. And at the end of verse 8, you can see he says, these things are excellent and profitable for everyone. And then at the end of verse 9, he says, these are unprofitable and useless. So what are these things that are excellent and profitable? What are the things that are useless and unprofitable? And how do we, uh, how do we gain value in our lives? How do we uh, build value into our lives and be profitable people? Because I think what Paul is telling Titus here uh, is, that, is that what he's been saying is something that people really need to invest in their lives. Have a look in verse 8. He says, this is a trustworthy saying. And I want you to stress these things so that those who have trusted in God may be careful to devote themselves to doing what is good. These things are excellent and profitable for everyone. This is a trustworthy saying, he starts. What he's, what's he talking about? This is a trustworthy saying. Well, it's the sentence that runs uh, from verses uh, 4 to 7. We can start at verse 3 is probably a good place to start because in verse 3 he reminds us that 
We, we are sinners. We, at one time, we too were foolish and disobedient, deceived and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. But here's this great sentence, this great statement that starts in verse 4. He says, But when the kindness and love of God our Saviour appeared, he saved us, not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ our Saviour, so that having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs, having the hope of eternal life. This is a trustworthy saying. You see, Paul's reminding Titus of that great truth of the gospel that we looked at last week, that God saves us. We don't save ourselves. We cannot save ourselves. God reaches down into our world through the person of the Lord Jesus Christ and he, and, and he brings salvation to us through his mercy and his grace. And this is great news, isn't it? This is a trustworthy saying. This is something he says that you need to trust in and you need to stress. I want you to stress these things so that those who have trusted in God may be careful to devote themselves to doing what is good. See, it's great to have a trustworthy saying. It's great to have something that we believe, but that belief has to be followed up with action, doesn't it? You don't just, don't just believe something and that's the end of it. Your belief has to be followed up with action. And this is the trustworthy saying. He says, first of all, you've got to believe this. You've got to know this and believe it. And I think this would have been, these verses, um, maybe verses 4 to 7, would have been a bit of a creed for people at the time. That, it might have been something they said in church where they reminded each other. Uh, maybe they memorised these verses. That's a good idea, isn't it? Let's memorise these verses. Let's memorise this statement and remind each other. It would have been a bit of a creed for them as they sought to encourage each other, to remind each other of the truth. And, and this trustworthy saying goes right back to the teaching of the Lord Jesus that's been passed down uh, through the apostles. We saw that in chapter 1, verse 9. A trustworthy saying is one that Jesus has passed down through his disciples and given to his church. But this trustworthy saying is also consistent with the great promises of the Old Testament. See that passage we had before? It's up on the screen, Ezekiel 36. Uh, what what um, Paul is saying to Titus here is consistent with God's promises in the Old Testament, where God says to his people who are sinful people, I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and I put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh and I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. God saves us. We don't save ourselves. I will. I will. I will. It's all God's action, isn't it? And even... That last bit, I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. Even as we put God's word into practice in our life, that's God's spirit doing that in us. This is a great word, isn't it? A faithful word, a trustworthy saying, a statement of our belief. This is sound doctrine. We've been looking at that idea, haven't we, in chapter 1 and chapter 2? Sound doctrine, or we describe that as healthy teaching. This is the healthy teaching that leads to a healthy faith when you put it into practice. He's saying, here's the truth of the gospel. You need to teach people how to live by that truth because when they live by that truth, it produces all those great things we saw back in chapter 2. It produces things like self-control, love, patience, not being addicted to wine, teaching and training others to be disciples of Jesus, being kind, being peacemakers, not troublemakers, being humble, not rebellious. You see, when you know the truth and you invest it into your life, God will change you. He has changed you. He has transformed you. You've been reborn. You've been cleansed. But God keeps changing us. You see there in, uh, in verse um, Five, at the end of verse 5, he saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit. Two things, you have been changed, you've been reborn and you are being changed day by day 
as you're renewed by the Holy Spirit. And Paul says to Titus in verse 8, back to verse 8, I want you to stress these things. In other words, to insist on them so that God's people will be careful to devote themselves to doing what is good. Teach the truth of the gospel. Don't waver from it. Don't, don't beef it up with worldly wisdom and say, so, you know, like the yeah, gospel's okay, but we need more than that. And I'm going to add to the gospel. Don't do that, he says. Teach the truth of the gospel. This is the trustworthy son. Don't, don't do the opposite to that. Don't water it down. As that, you know, like, oh, it's a bit, that's a bit confronting for people. And maybe they'll be a bit too challenged by it. So I'll just water it down a bit. Now he says, teach the truth of the gospel so that people will be careful to devote themselves to doing what is good. That's what, that's the focus of the leadership of this church, the parish council, the pastoral council, everything we do at church, all our resources that we own as a church, uh, everything, all our activities that we do, the focus of those is to promote the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, to show people the good news of salvation through Jesus' life, death and resurrection so that people will uh, grow and, and God will transform their lives. Because when you teach the truth and how it changes the way Christians live, that's when you'll see a prophet in people's lives. That's where prophet comes from. And when people invest the truth in their lives or invest, uh, invest their lives in the truth, you'll see that prophet come. How does it come? Verse 8, he says, so that they may devote themselves to doing what is good. Now, we had that phrase back in chapter 2 as well, to doing what is good was more a pattern of good works. So it's not just doing individual good things. It's a pattern, a lifestyle of doing good works. Things like that, that we saw that I mentioned before, things like you know, where are we? Self-control, love, patience, not being addicted to drink, being teachable and teaching others, being peacemakers, not troublemakers, being humble. You see, these are all the things that will uh, that can come, this pattern of good works, when we invest the truth in our lives. These things are excellent and profitable. They're good things, aren't they? Look at that list. These are good things. They are excellent and profitable. They're good for us personally because they'll add value to your life. But they're also good for us corporately together as God's family here together because those things will help us to grow as God's family. Don't you love testimonies? That was great, um, Brent and Elizabeth being up here and she said, oh, I don't have a really exciting story. There's nothing exciting. How exciting is it to see parents bring up their kids to know and love the Lord? I think that's really exciting. I think that's a great testimony to see parents who have taught their kids the truth and how that truth works itself out in daily Christian life. That's what we want, isn't it? Because that's a profitable life. Teaching your kids the truth will add value to their life. Teaching your kids to follow the Lord Jesus will add value to their life. Taking your kids away and, and doing other things with them, yeah, like they'll have fun playing soccer or they'll, you know, they'll, they'll get a blast out of playing cricket. But those things aren't going to add value to your kid's life like these things are. So parents, make sure your kids have got a boring testimony. <laughs> but, uh, like I grew up as a Christian. What a great testimony, isn't it? It's exciting to see parents investing the gospel in their kids' lives. And if you can say that about your kids, or if your kids can say that about you when they're old, that's a great testimony. See, investing the truth in life will result in growth, personal growth and a healthy faith. And you'll be a person who makes a valuable contribution to others. You'll be, uh, you'll be encouraging people and urging them on and helping to grow a healthy, strong church. So that's where we get profit. And that's how we invest in, our, our, in the truth in our lives. But 
What happens when you don't invest in the truth? What happens when you focus on unimportant things rather than the trustworthy message? What happens if you refuse to let the truth of the gospel shape your life? Well, you're going to lose. Look at verses 9 to 11. Paul's saying this to Titus. He's saying, avoid personal controversies and genealogies and arguments and quarrels about the law because these are unprofitable and useless. Warn a divisive person once and then warn him a second time. After that, have nothing to do with him. You may be sure that such a man is warped and sinful. He is self-condemned. See, here we find the opposite of sound doctrine, the sound doctrine and the healthy teaching that leads to healthy works and, and, and sorry, healthy faith and good works. It's obviously in Titus's time there were people who wanted to be teachers, but they weren't teaching God's truth. Instead, they were focusing on things that were controversial, uh, foolish controversies, Paul describes them as. They were speculating about what God might be doing or what might God be going to do. Just speculating, but they weren't getting it from the Bible. They were looking to genealogies for the answers, looking for, for answers in, in their human history, in the history of God's people, rather than God's revealed plan of salvation in the Lord Jesus Christ. They were arguing and quarrelling about the law. You know, we should be keeping those Old Testament um, feasts that they used to do for so many years. You know, we, we should be keeping the Sabbath like our forefathers used to. Um, circumcision obviously is essential. Look, just look at what it says in the in the Bible. Uh, food laws. We, you know, don't eat pork, don't eat oysters, all the good stuff. Yeah, you know, they they're focusing on all these things that are not relevant. And Paul says none of these things are going to bring about a healthy faith and good works. They are unprofitable. You won't gain anything from them. And they are useless because nothing good comes from arguing about those things. Don't focus on those things. Instead, stress these things. The truth about the Lord Jesus Christ, his life, his death, his resurrection. If you focus on those things, it'll just be a drain on the resources of the church. Because Titus, you'll spend up, end up um, spending more time putting out the fires and dealing with the troublemakers instead of spending your time promoting the power of the gospel to transform lives. You know, if you're looking at making a profit, there's this image they use often to do with um, finances that um, if you're looking to make a profit, you've got to have more coming in than going out, and the image is of a bathtub. Okay, if you're talking about finances, uh, what you want is to have more coming in through the tap than go, is going out down the plug hole. That's the way you make money, isn't it? You have more coming in than going out. But what um, to, uh, Paul's saying to Titus is here is you've got to plug up that plug hole. You've got to stop the people who are draining the resources of your church. How do we make sure that God's church is profitable? Plug up the plug hole and increase the inflow. Don't focus on those things. Focus on these things, the truth, and invest that in the lives of people. And if people do insist on those things, look at verses 10 and 11. Warn a divisive person once and then warn him a second time. After that, have nothing to do with him. If they cause, you give them three chances, don't you? Strike one, strike two, strike three and you're out. Cut them loose. Because Titus, you can't afford for them to drain the resources of your ministry because they're just going to suck you dry. This is difficult as a church leader. And over, over 21 years now of church ministry, I haven't had many experiences of this in the last 21 years, but when you do get them, they're difficult. It's difficult to deal with people who are just being divisive and bring up things that are just foolish controversies just for the sake of it. But you've got to do it. It's essential for the health of the church that we are growing. We are growing to be a profitable church. Well, have you been experiencing 
the transforming power of the truth of God's gospel? Have you been adding value to your life? Are you adding value to the church family? Because look at back at verse 8, this really key verse. He says, this is a trustworthy saying, and I want you to stress these things so that those who have trusted in God may be careful to devote themselves to doing what is good. These things are excellent and profitable for everyone. Have you been so impacted by the marvellous truth of God's gospel, God's generous grace and mercy to us sinners, that you are becoming devoted to a pattern of good works? Now, I'm hoping the answer is yes, okay? But I know for some people today, maybe the answer to some of these questions is no. And if you're answering any of these questions, no, there's some urgent treatment needed. And the first thing we need to do is to know Jesus and the salvation that comes through Jesus. So the first thing you do is you read the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. And soak yourself in the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at who he was, what he did, how he leads us to a life uh, that uh, is, is far better than anything we can imagine now and beyond the grave. Soak yourself in the gospel of Jesus. You need to find a Christian who you trust to help you with that. Because if you're just here each week to warm up the seats, then you're not gaining anything and you're not adding value to the church family. It's only through knowing the truth of the gospel and and the incredible promises uh, that are all fulfilled in Jesus in his life and death and resurrection. It's only through knowing that truth and putting it into practice in your life that will change you for good. Let me pray for us. Father God, we thank you that you call us to a profitable life, a life where we will grow and change to become more like Jesus. Father, I pray that you would help us to see, uh, to know, uh, to understand the truth of the gospel. The Lord Jesus came to live with us, to die for us and to rise again. And all that means for your grace and mercy in our lives. Father, I pray that you would help us to be, have this truth so deeply in our heart that we will be transformed by your spirit, that we will grow each day to become more like Jesus. Father, I pray that you would help each one of us. We go through ups and downs. We go through good times and bad times. We go through struggles and doubts. And I pray, Lord, that you would help us to hold on to this trustworthy saying that you saved us, that you were transforming us, become more like your son. Father, I pray that this will um, produce changes in our life that are profitable and excellent. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.